Before we get straight into the podcast, I just want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, D Kirby GA Star. Declan Kirby GA Star Championship Journey. It's a series of GA team children's books written by primary school teacher and GA coach Michael Egan. You can check it out in the link in the description down below, of course, as well. Follow the trials and tribulations of Declan Kirby and his team at Smith Green Gaelic Football Club, recently formed a promising GA team. The book is now available in Easton's and all good bookshops, so check it out in the description down below. And let's get straight into it welcome back to ga fan tv my name is aaron i'm delighted to be joined here today by uh, irish times journalist eamon donahue to recap obviously the the weekend's games in both gaelic football and hurling obviously eamon there was a lot of um big talking points obviously across the the weekend but i suppose first of all how's the how's the crack with yourself good now good enjoying the nice weather and um enjoying the games being back and so many of them and having something to to talk about that isn't premier league soccer <laughs> um, yeah. because I don't think whether you're a Premier League soccer fan or not the last year or the last six months there's been nothing else to watch or talk about or do so it's great to have GA back and have the games on and the standard has been good um, the conditions have been good for the majority of the games and yeah it's just nice weather so it's a big improvement on where we were a few weeks ago 100% yeah like and I'm a, I'm a Liverpool fan so I was kind of happy to to see the back of the Premier League in, in all honesty the way we kind of just snuck into the into the top four there at the end but yeah, I suppose we'll, we'll run through some of the, the big games, obviously, from the from the weekend and football, obviously, starting off by looking through uh, Division 1 North. I suppose two draws and Armad Donegal, first of all, I mean, a bit of a cracking game in, in some ways, going down to the war, tense drama, but I suppose in the end, uh, it finished all square, finished how it started. Yeah, i seen that game. Um, Armad were, in a lot of ways, the better team. Like, Donegal came back and then it was a really strange finale. Like, like I know that so you could say it was good game management and our, our man or Donegal needed the draw and they knew the draw was enough but like when the game was level and like instead of going for the win or you know going for it and again it or not and then the other team going for the point like Donegal just played it out for the draw kept possession um, but they did well to come back they showed a lot of um, mental resolve because Armagh were well ahead and cruising I'm um, sure a lot of it um, Armagh looked impressive at forwards looked really fluid um, they looked really mobile around the middle. Defense was defending. Re- the defenders were defending really tenaciously, um, and Donny just looked very flat, reliant on individuals. And in the end, some individual excellence for Paddy McBrady, uh, Mio Langan with his unbelievable goal, and the subs came on and kind of did their own like push for scores and added a bit of energy, and it got them over the line. But like Arma, without looking like they could actually push on because they didn't even get the job done there. But Armagh did look, that were on that proof of that game, they were the better team. Yeah, 100%, I suppose, because they had that chance at the end as well when, when Conor Turba hit the post. And if that had gone over the bar, you would have felt Armagh would have surely, you know, seen the game out. And I suppose it's another missed opportunity, I suppose, in some ways for Armagh, because obviously in the Tyrone game, you had the Stefan Campbell missed penalty. And then in this yeah. game, like, they were very, very close. And all they needed really was, a, was another point, you know, so if they had a seen out the Donegal game or drawn with Tyrone, I suppose they would have been in the top two. But I suppose, that, like, you have to give them credit as well. Finishing with three points, like, definitely, you know, have proven in many ways that they can compete at Division One level. Yeah, yeah. And they've been, and like, you'd imagine if they had a longer league and they kind of can build on those and get confidence from them and they'd eventually get, they'd hope to get wins against the weaker teams and, you know, have more chance of surviving in the older format. But at the same time, I think the fact that they're, that they're dominating, they're not dominating, but they're definitely the better, the better team overall in these games, and are leading for long periods, and not getting the win. I think it's, you know, it's, it's shown in how they're playing. Like the big one for me is that they concede the kick out constantly. Like, like they concede every kick out, so they're allowing the opposition so much possession that it allows the opposition, even when they're beaten, to grow their way back into the game. So like Donegal were a beaten team, but they had so much possession they were able to grow their way in back into it like so um instead of killing them off going for it you know so when you play that way you leave you leave yourself open for you know an even contest because you're automatically even in the possession stakes so um or even let or even less if you're playing against a team who knows how to use that or or is intent on using it so um yeah i think there's the way they play is going to hold them back in some senses but at the same time there's a few teams who've been doing that with the kick out so maybe we'll see we'll start to see the the genius behind it but it's not really doing it for me and it really lets really frustrates me actually watching Armagh play that they that they keep doing it so yeah. um and 
yeah, otherwise they're they're a lovely team. They play with lovely speed. Like when Stephen Campbell is on it and he was on it in that game, like it's just such a beautiful footballer at both feet. The Turbo looks really good player. He come on, he's really direct. Like even to go for that score, they could have held possession and seen it out themselves. But he went for it and he hit the post and that gave Tony Gold the chance then to get to get back on and get the equalizer or to hold it out for the draw. So um yeah, they're brave and a lot of the things they do well, but I think that's a big thing which is letting them down. Yeah, I think it's game management, I suppose, as well, in many ways, because he had that Oshin O'Neill chance late on as well, and he ended up going for a point from from miles away. Like, and you know, you wouldn't yeah. see a, a Dublin or a Donegal or even a Kerry to a, to a certain extent do something like that. There just seems to be whether it's a bit of inexperience, I'm not sure, but I'd imagine anyway, the likes of Kieran McGinney, Kieran Donaghy were probably you know laying into some of the lads there, I suppose, after the game because there was definitely the chance to see it out. Like. And he, he scored one from, uh, he must have scored one from 50, over 50 metres in the, right at the mm. end of the first. And um, I had a text from a friend saying, like, that's the problem. Like, I was just, I was still in awe about, of the score. And it was like, that's the problem with Armagh. He'll, t- he'll shoot one now later on and go wide. And at the end of the game, it wasn't even as hard a shot. And he went, for, when it just was, you just got to recycle and get the better odds shot. Like, you might have that in your locker. You know, like. Dublin players have that in their locker, but they don't do it. Like you know, so they they build for the better odds shot, and like that's not saying don't shoot from like the edge of the scope, but like you don't shoot from something that's just uh, like a real clutch shot from way out. Like it just you just don't do it. But at the same time, the, those O'Neill, the O'Neill brothers were fantastic. In the second half, I don't know why they stopped going as direct. Um, I think during the first half, Hugh McFadden he was fantastic for Donegal. Like he was just everywhere and so physical. And he dropped back um, as often as he could in front of um, that link between the two O'Neills. And he cut out a lot of high ball. Um, but I still think that there was enough opportunities where he couldn't get back. Or even by just having that option, it would keep Donegal honest and keep them stretched. And I don't think they exercised it enough as the second half wore on and they just started coming deeper. And yeah, but it's all it's just experience, you know, and not losing is still an improvement on other years where they've kind of in old championship, especially in big games, they've pushed teams tight and then fallen apart completely. Yeah, and I suppose speaking of experience, obviously Donegal are certainly a team that showed a lot of experience in that game. And I suppose Patrick McBrearty, like un- undoubtedly, like especially with that left foot, probably on his day, one of the best forwards in the country. And I suppose considering the injuries that Donegal had coming into the game, like Neil McGee, Oshin Gallen, Michael Murphy, I suppose like for them to fight back just like they done against Monaghan, like they do deserve a lot of credit, I suppose, for for getting back into the game. Yeah, and they were, you know, they were out. They were being completely outplayed. They were being squeezed. Um, they were just struggling, and they looked slow. And they, they just kept at it. You know, they kept at it. They kept playing like they kept just coming and coming. And their bench made a massive impact. Conor O'Donnell came on and kicked beauty with his left foot. And then he kicked a beauty with his right foot. Um, so they made an impact. Mike Brady had to burden it all inside with no Gallon or Murphy. And you'd imagine Murphy would have, or Gallon would have made a difference without Murphy there. So he was even taking frees for a right footer and he missed a few frees, but there, again, they were for a right footer. And um, Mike Brady had to step up. Hugh McFadden, I think, really had to step up. And Ryan McHugh was qu- kind of quiet, but he worked really hard and he stuck at it. And they just showed that they're just a really experienced group and that they've that they have a massive amount of want still there because you don't fight for the league games like that unless you really want to, um, yeah, unless your team still has a lot of hunger. So um, that's impressive with them going into an Ulster Championship that they still have that that massive hunger there. But they need to get guys back and they need to improve. They need to improve their speed out of defence. So people talk about their defence being weak, actually defensively. Um, especially in comparison to midfield and forward line. But what I thought was when our mag conceded the kick out, they just looked very slow and um, predictable coming out of defence even. So they need to improve that um, big time because the teams will take that and they will allow them time and space back there. And they're no real threat. Whereas you think of Donny Gall under Jim McGuinness and stuff like that. And like even the likes of Paddy McGrath and um, Anthony Thompson and those guys, like they were given and going. Carl Lacey, obviously, they were giving and going and they were and you, when McGee is there, you still see that. And it's not even that them players are going to cause a massive threat, but it's just the movement and the speed and the unpredictability of it. And at the moment, they're just a very predictable, very one paced. So um, I'd be a bit worried about them, but at the same time, they did show a lot of strength. So that has to be commended. 
Yeah, and I suppose like with all those injuries, like where would you even put them? I suppose going into a potential Ulster Championship, well, the Ulster Championship, I suppose, because obviously if very competitive with the likes of Tyrone, Armagh, even Derry, who'll get on to in a moment, are looking quite bright. So yeah. I suppose for Donegal, like there's there's still a bit of work to do, especially with getting maybe some of those players back going into Ulster and I suppose the league semi final as well. Yeah, it's like a lot of teams are kind of coming in and looking good, but there's no real like other like Donegal aren't the finished product but they're still like a team that's won a lot of other titles and they're strong they're a real strong team that's kind of just needs a few things to improve them and maybe get them to All-Ireland challenges which they look like they had been but they've kind of kept falling short the last few years where the other Ulster teams are you know you know from a lot of those teams they've always been good that they could have a good year and who knows where it could bring them but at the same time they're earlier in their stages of development than Donegal um, so it's hard to see um, anyone standing out as a complete threat to Donegal but um, last year's team with Cavan and no one expected that but I think that's the likely kind of the fact that Donegal look vulnerable I think they look vulnerable to a team beating them like Cavan did last year more so than another team in Ulster coming through and just being so strong because I actually think from the teams that I've seen um, I know you have to judge teams by their divisions but I thought Derry were the most impressive of the older Ulster teams so um, yeah it's it's a it's a strange one, but I just think that the way they're playing leaves them very 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 vulnerable. Yeah, and I suppose in the other game, obviously at Toronto and Monaghan, that finished thirteen points apiece. I suppose touching on Monaghan first of all, like it's it's an interesting one with Monaghan at the moment. Like they haven't won a game since twenty third of February twenty twenty. Like you have to go back to before the the pandemic to the middle of the league season back in twenty twenty. They've shown obviously a bit of fight, like coming back, obviously you know, or getting a draw with Donegal, getting a draw with Tyrone, but I suppose it's hard to know really if they're if they're improving under Banty McEnany at the moment. I'm not too sure what you think. Well, one thing for the men away is that they're, they're definitely playing new players and they're definitely trying guys like who kind of were in the squad. I know that they've got some lads coming back from injury who were coming on the last day, like Desi Ward, Kieran Hughes, these guys that you'd imagine that like if they were there, they probably would be starting Malone. Um, they're very good players. And but in their absence, there are some kinds of lads who are on, on the squad, like O'Hanlon. Um, and they've got some new players there, centre forward, centre back. And some players are looking looking very good. And one thing I like about Monaghan is that he seems to have a style of play that he wants. They're very fast. They're very fast. They play very counter attack and they're very careful in possession. Like, and they won't do anything too risky, like to play it through the hands, but they still go at massive pace and they carry a massive counter attack and threat. And yeah, for Banty, in fairness to him, he's given guys a chance and he's also developing kind of a style of play. And I think those two things are quite obvious. Um, for them, Niall Cairns, I think, is a massive one to get fit and to get back. Um, he's huge to them in the middle of the field. Um, that's where they've, they've struggled before they found him and in the year he got the All-Star nominee and they struggled without him last year when he's had the fitness and illness and stuff like that. So they need to get him right and they need to get the right balance then between their new guys and their old guys. But um, yeah, before, coming into the league, I didn't really hold out much hope for them, but I actually think they're, they're building something nice there. And any team that has Donny Buckley involved with them, you can expect a really good championship intensity and execution of skills at that intensity. So, um, yeah, so they're one of the teams I've actually been very impressed with, more so even than Tyrone, because I, I haven't, I for one haven't seen this radical change in Tyrone that people are suggesting or looking for looking for it so much they're almost hoping to force themselves to see it um a lot of similar personnel um obviously a couple of new guys coming in who have done well but um for the large part um kicking the ball a bit more but a similar kind of structure so um yeah but monaghan in that monaghan in that game again should have i think Again, it's just a thing of pushing on, and but they're all these teams are all seem to be at an early stage in the development. You know, the new enough management teams. Banty come in in COVID year, still new enough management teams and new enough on that stage of development. They haven't had much time this season, even. So um, you just won't know with them. Momentum is a big thing. Yeah, and I suppose with, with the likes of Rory Woods and, and Aaron Mulligan, like obviously coming through, I suppose they do have the players coming through. I suppose like, and obviously we've seen Conor McCarthy, like he's done really well at a club level the yeah. past couple of years. He just hasn't always probably done it in a, in a Monaghan jersey. But and I suppose when you have Conor McManus, who obviously didn't start the first two late league games, like there definitely is still a, a lot of potential in Monaghan. I suppose to and when you look at the the way the Ulster Championship draws as well like it's not inconceivable that they don't maybe reach an Ulster final and, and crack on from there 
Yeah, and I, I really like the thing is Mac Menemum is his name, I think, center half back. He's got a real like intensity and a real like um yeah, he's constantly going forward and uh he attacks everything. And their midfielder isn't the biggest of a new midfielder found there, but he's very mobile, very fast. Um so yeah, they've uncovered new players and as you said, they still have strong enough players, even Colin Boyle or Boyle there at fullback. Um so and then they've a, a massive, massive advantage, obviously, in having an excellent goalkeeper. It maybe pushes it a little bit far and how much is coming out, but like he's a massive advantage to them as an extra defender um coming out with the ball and his goal kick his his kickouts. So yeah, they're a team who I've been impressed with during the league. And even before last week, and I was last week, and I was sure that Tyrone were going to beat them, and um, and they, they could have come out of that with the win. So they're a team that definitely yeah, look on the look on the up. Um, as far as from what I'm seeing, and as I said, they've got new guys. They've got big players to come back: Malone, Ward, Kieran Hughes. They're really, really good players, and lads with really good attitude, and lads who are um, still are very young and very hungry. Mm. And I suppose you were kind of touching on it there with, with Tyrone. I suppose I think a lot of people are kind of looking for Tyrone to click at some point, and we're kind of waiting for the for the pieces to all fall together. But I suppose for the first three games anyway, like they've shown some promise there with the likes of Paul Donaghy coming in, but Conor McKenna probably doesn't look the same player as what he looked last year. And I suppose for, for Tyrone under their new management, I suppose just probably a bit of work to do before they get to the level, I suppose, that everyone expects anyways. Yeah, and you're, Donaghy's been really good and he's he's kind of a contrast to what they generally have. Um, but McShane is a big one for them who they need to get back. Um it will free up McKenna. He's not really an inside stick it in there, man. He's kind of a bit of a, he's obviously a great tackler and has a great attitude, but he's still kind of a bit of a luxury player. And the fact you kind of have to let him float around and let him do his own thing. And yeah, you don't want him doing that in the inside line unless you let him out, but they they need to have a focal point inside and they're leaving it as him. And he's not really that comfortable there. He, he'll obviously do a job anywhere. He'd be able to play full back and do a job, but he, um they're not getting the most out of him there and they're not getting, you know, what they'd get out of Colin McShane by playing him inside. Um, but Donahue has been good. Canavan is obviously getting more responsibility and he's obviously looking really good as well. But they're still playing a lot of guys in the forwards who aren't really natural forwards. I'd like to see more natural forwards played in there and try and get a bit of link play between them. Like for Tyrone, the transition always is between backs and forwards. But like, I think the really top teams transition between forwards and forwards. Like, you know, you look at Dublin, there's always a first receiver and the next receiver, like the forwards play between each other, especially Kerry. You know, the ball comes into Sean O'Shea and he, play, like, there's two lines where Tyrone love to break out and then try and get that link play. And before it was too much through the hands and now they're kicking it a bit more. But there's, they're looking for that ball inside and then to play from that again, where you want the forward, if you have more kind of forwards who are different types of forwards inside, they can play off of each other. And I'd like to see more yeah, just more natural forwards played in that Tyrone team. I think they can afford to because they just have a great culture of work rate in their squad and in their county. And they have enough really good players outside of that. But um, position for Tyrone, which has really let them down in how they play. Like, they don't have midfielders, really. You know, so, um, like, you see, he doesn't generally play there. But you see Frank Burns lining out with the number nine. Like, they don't have natural midfielders. And I think it does cost them because, again, that link play, you know, midfield forward line, it do, it's not really there, you know, so it's, it's, it's relying on a really clean, fast, long transition. And that's not always on. So, and that forces them to turn back and keep the ball. And, you know, so like Mickey Hart wasn't, uh, he wasn't playing in the way he was completely because he was stuck in his ways because he did change his team, but like he had a certain personnel and um, yeah, so he, they are limited, but I, the one thing they can control is getting more forwards on the field. Mm. Yeah, cause I, yeah, yeah, because I suppose under Mickey Hart, like they did, they did play attacking football at times. Like they did rack up some, yeah. some high scores. Oh, like yeah. you, you think back to to when they 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 completely demolished Armagh, like in a in a court final there. I remember a few years ago. Like what what do you kind of see with their their style of play? Do they look like a team that's kind of you know are, are more on the front foot now? Because I know obviously like we've seen a, an image that was floating around on Twitter there about a couple of weeks ago it showed a lot I think six or seven of the forwards like all high up in the pitch like kind of in the the full forward area do, do they look like a team that's changed their style in your opinion or, or are they still kind of playing that Mickey Hart kind of style well that's based on like your your position in 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 possession will be based on like your defensive style so like they're pressing up now so like when they turn the ball over 
they've got six forwards up because their six forwards are all pressing. So, but I don't. I think that when they get the ball, like to say, for instance, they turn over a team in the full back line, in their own full back line. That's when I'd be looking at how many forwards you have up and where they are. And you don't like you need to. Th- that's where I think they still struggle. Like you know, then forwards don't need to be in the. But they need to have links to be able to play through those guys. To you know, and you, you need to have certain players to play in them roles and. I just think that they play guys in those roles who are like real workers or who are, but you need to make allowances for, for some more football intelligent guys. And I don't really see that there, as I said, for a, for a Tyrone transition to work, it has to be very fast. It's always very fast. Like they'll turn over and they'll come out through the hands, through the hands. And like, you know, like I remember when they first put McShane inside and they put Maddie Donnelly inside with him, everyone was complaining. They lost the first few rounds of the league, maybe about three years ago. And, they put McShane and Maddie Donnelly inside together and the two of them were fantastic and they were playing way more direct ball. But again, it was that from half back line into the full forward line, direct ball. And they were getting up massive scores and they, they stayed up like, you know, so it's, and then they had a big year and those are champs. So like Mickey has, has played more attacking at certain times. So people are talking about more kicking and then they're, this pushing up. Everyone is doing it now in the division one. They're all pushing up more. Mayo were the big ones who did it last year. So, I wouldn't read into any of that. I think that they need to literally pick more link forwards, you know, more link forwards in, in that attack who have a score in mind, a football in mind, and they need to find those guys and trust them, you know? So, and other counties do that because it's, the first ball shouldn't always be, you know, Frank Burns from his half back line, kicking it into the corner, into the space for, you know, McKenna or McShane, whoever's in there coming out and then he collects it and you've got five or six runners coming like, that's a lovely way of playing, but that doesn't always work. And if that doesn't work, you need to have another option other than just turning backwards and hand passing the ball around. Um, and you look at Dublin, like they've got all of the different forwards are coming out. They've got so many different options. And then if they get it in, it does. Then they can they can play all the different ways. But Tyrone are limited, I think, because of the personnel that they play in their attack. Yeah, and I suppose obviously next for Tyrone will be Kerry, who obviously comfortably dispatched the uh, Ross Common over in Division One South, two fifteen to one twelve. I suppose it was a close game going into the the final quarter. There was, I think, they were they were level at one point. There was only a couple of points in it really until the until the late goal. But uh, what was your thoughts on on that win for Kerry? And I suppose what's what's your thoughts been on, on Kerry in general? I suppose so far in the in the national league. Well, that game, looking at that game exclusively, I thought that Kerry gave some guys like Tony Brosnan and um, Buckley centre forward, um, a few of the backs. They gave some guys an opportunity. And they really didn't take it. Like they really showed the difference between their starters and their subs. Um, was a big step. And I think Russ Common came into that game, especially the second half. They tore into it, and Kerry dealt with it to win the game. But they definitely didn't match it. I think that's a big difference with Dublin and Kerry. And it was shown if Dublin come down to High Park and Russ Common want to mix it with them. John Small and Brian Howard and these boys, they'll mix it. If you want to play football with them, they'll play football with you. If you want to mix it with them, they'll mix it with you. And Kerry just really showed a lack of want for that fight. And their football carried them through. And like was comments errors and they capitalized it in Clifford. And you know, but they were in trouble. It was 12 all they got. The sending off was a joke. You shouldn't have sent it off like. But aside from that, it was 12 all and they started emptying their bench. And was common started emptying their bench, more so giving guys runs who they were kind of brought on some very inexperienced players and yeah they won it comfortably enough in the end but they were in trouble for a certain period of it was common in the first half were doing well but they were conceding the kickout second half they pushed up on the kickout because Kerry were playing into the wind and the game changed so um was common would say that that was because of the wind but it just showed for me contesting kickouts you've got to actually push up and make a contest of it they pushed up on Kerry they started leaving a bit in after the ball and Roscommon aren't a physical team but they wanted it and Kerry just showed a massive that that's exactly what went wrong against Cork last year they showed a massive lack of appetite for winning those games and to be all Ireland champions against a team like Dublin when Dublin are in it you need to have that appetite constantly to you know just every time you're out just to demolish everything and that comes from squad depth and the players who came in from Kerry didn't do it you know where if Dublin would give two or three guys a run they'll them guys would be scoring one three one four so then the next guys would come in when they get when they're playing they can't let the foot off the gas um and Kerry let the foot off the gas in that game and it was shown because the guys who did come in didn't step up 
Yeah, and I suppose because with, with Kerry in general, I think a lot of people are kind of having them, I suppose, as the the closest team to, to beat the dubs. And like when you look at their forwards, like they're, you know, with the likes of David Clifford, Paddy Clifford obviously coming in, Paul Gainey, Stephen O'Brien, who didn't even start, of course, in the first game. Like they, they've so much talent going forward. It just seems to be the midfield and the defence that's the issue. And I suppose maybe the, the structure of, of how they set out, I suppose. Yeah. Well, the, the point that I was making about like their mentality is dangerous for them to even get to the Iron Final in the first place because they could get caught again. And it's dangerous in that, like, it's just that couple of percent that could be the difference between them and Dublin. And that's something which is lacking. But in terms of their team overall, like in what we've seen against Galway, um, especially when they put out kind of a stronger team, when Jack Barry comes into the middle third, he's a big addition. I know O'Connor has played well around the field, but he doesn't have the same physicality. Um, and like you need Barry there essentially anyway to Mark Fenton if they play against Dublin. David Moran has been off of it. He got a, a head collision early in that game and, you know, it was very, like, he, he lost a lot of blood and he came back in and he just kind of wasn't as dominant as you'd expect him to be in a game like that. Um, and if he can't dominate games like that, he kind of struggles with the movement of the Dublins and Mayo's anyway. So he he's a bit of a concern for them. And defensively, yeah, they just, they, they seem to kind of be intent on, like, really tackling hard and pushing up, but they get broken through very easily. So, um Foley played well for them in the full back line against Roscommon and one Roscommon forwards are very good so it was a good test for them defensively but um, they'd be, they would have been happy to have not conceded a goal and then that last goal was very easily conceded so um, I've been one who's been you know blowing Kerry's horn for a while um, but this year has actually worried me about them to be honest um, just men- mentally and defensively they look a little bit frail but we'll see and they have so much quality it's only small percentages and they could find those percentages in like you've seen Kerry teams in years gone by losing Munster Championships coming through the back door. They don't have that this year, but they could, you know, a few things could make a massive difference. A few changes could make a ma- massive difference for them. So I wouldn't be writing them off or I wouldn't be getting too excited. Yeah, I suppose it was it was classic Kerry in many ways back in the day when they always used to, I suppose, come through the back door and kind of lead you on and make you think that they're, they're, they're going to, you know, not not beat the dubs and everything else, but I suppose speaking of Dublin, obviously they beat Galway two sixteen to one fifteen. Mm. I suppose it was for Dublin anyway. It looked like they definitely weren't at their their absolute best, and they didn't really need to be. They were kind of I suppose just in many ways cruising through the game with some of the the new lads obviously coming into the team as well. Yeah, but Dublin, what well, they'll take from it is finding the guys like they seem to have found a, like a really strong midfielder or Coffee Burn. Like he's a he's a powerhouse and like he's mad for work, mad for tackling perfect balance with Fenton like who obviously is such a natural footballer who's physical as well but like if you have someone real abrasive with him who still will do the simple the simple things in possession and is comfortable in possession um but he looks like a real addition I know he's young and when it comes to the heat of championship against a Mayo or a, a Kerry and you had to kind of bring that physicality to that level to step up but um he looks like a find um, even when he came on against Roscommon, he looked like, you know, he's getting turnovers. And that's what teams are looking for now around the middle of the field. He's getting turnovers constantly. He's constantly in the tackle. And um, and he's very clever in possession. And he's a big man, so he's a kick-out option. So he looks like a complete find. And I thought he played very well in that game and looked very natural and comfortable with Fenton. So um, that's that's a, a step for them. And But yeah, they, did, they didn't look as fluid in the first half especially. Um, but Galway played well. And that was a big step up for Galway. They held possession really well and they made it hard to play against. And Galway, the thing with Galway, obviously, when they get things right, they have a lot of talent. So um, it's a hard one to read because Galway was so bad against Kerry the first day. But like, if you're bringing Galway back to the standard they were pre-COVID, you know, Galway were, were very competitive. And Galway have a massive amount of talent in both club level and underage county level coming through. So... Um, with Dublin not being at their full strength and not being at their best, still winning is, you know, a win is win. Yeah, and I suppose for Galway, like, they, they definitely did show signs of improvement, all right. Like, I was impressed with Peter Cook in midfield. I actually thought he he had a good game who okay. came in. But I suppose Shane Walsh, like, he's obviously the the man on everyone's lips, I suppose, when they, when they think of Galway. Like, I mean, 10 points on the day and he can kick them on his left, his right. I mean, there's not yeah. much he, uh, he can't do. Yeah, Shane Walsh is phenomenal in there. And, like, I think that if if Galway have full strength, um, Joyce wants to leave him in a full forward, like because he's a phenomenal player. But when he comes out, come, sometimes it comes a bit more of the Shane Walsh show, where 
Joyce has consistently wanted him to stay inside and be that go-to, reliable inside forward. And yeah, so when they get everyone, it'll just be interesting to see the way they float it. Like again, pre-COVID, Walsh was inside. Comer was out the field, floating around the field, out the field from like wing forward. And they looked very um, balanced. So Tierney is a big find for them. Um, he was brilliant in the under-21 at centre-forward and he was all strapped up in a lot of those big games and he was still fantastic. And he's stepped in really well, even when he's playing around the middle, um, which he wouldn't even play for his club. But like he's looked very comfortable at midfield, half-forward, and he's a great option to have around there. So for Galway, looking at them, they'll have to come through the Connacht Championship and they've Roscommon in the first game. Like That's where they'll have, that's where they'll have the, the edge over Roscommon is middle-third. And they'll be really reliant on... Conroy, Cook, and Tierney, and Comer, if he's around there, to dominate. And then that gives that's the any time they've ever beaten Roscommon, that's been why they've beaten them. And then the games where they've where Roscommon have beaten them is because Roscommon have broken even or just a bit below even in the middle third. So um but yeah, they look good. Um McHugh coming out of the back line is very light, but like he's a lovely footballer. He's a lovely, lovely footballer. And um he has that bit of curve in about him coming out of centre back. And centre back is such a big important role in terms of distribution. And he he made their moves very slick and he looked good there. And yeah, they just the team just looks like it's improving as the league is going on, which is huge because we've got such a short running from league in the championship. So Joyce afterwards was delighted in what he was saying. And yeah, I'm sure he will be he will be happy um if they continue in that way. I know it. Absolutely, yeah. Like I suppose that's the main thing for, for for Galway in many ways, I suppose, is trying to find obviously they have Shane Walsh and Damian Comer, but the likes of Tom O'Callaghan and Matthew Tierney, like you mentioned, I suppose, because there is plenty of talent coming through Galway at the moment. We've seen Jack Lynn in there as well. Like obviously they were under twenty All Ireland champions last year. So definitely a lot of potential in, in that Galway team. Oh, Galway have as many underage All Ireland medals and if you bring in club All Ireland medals as many or more than Dublin have you know Galway are powerhouse of a football county and they have massive pedigree of them lads coming through and um, that under 20 team now especially Tierney is coming through they're probably a little bit young but Tierney is very much able and capable and they're just about, it's just about the big problem with Galway is they had that few barren years and they lost that conveyor belt of like leaders essentially so your 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 standards and stuff struggled. Kevin Walsh came in and settled the ship, and he did quite well with them. And they made the most out of kind of a a, a batch that they had. And now they need more. But it, the question that people are asking is like, for their leaders to do more. And suddenly, like Shane Walsh is being expected to be a leader, but like, who was kind of the leader for him? Like it wasn't that long ago he was the young lad, and now he's suddenly the leader. Where no one kind of showed him how to be that, you know. And that's the, that's the problem that Galway for me. I see that struggling with them a little bit. They're a little bit soft, isn't the word, but they're they're a bit vulnerable, you know. Um, so that's that can only come from experiences of winning, you know, tough, gritty games and building that themselves. So, um, but yeah, Galway are a team who if they get it right, you know, if Galway got to as many All Ireland finals as Mayo have been, they, they won't be losing them. Oh, that's, that's not much for sure because Galway when they get there, they'll they'll do the business like because their confidence. You know, the, there's no one who's more full of themselves or sure of themselves than Galway. And when they get there, you know, their confidence will go through the roof. So, um, yeah, it's just for them a matter of getting a few, a bit of experience, a bit of momentum and a few wins and getting to them lockout, knockout stages, which they haven't got to yet. A big All-Ireland semi-final or something like that would be huge for them. Yeah, and I suppose, obviously, speaking of Mayo, like moving on to division two north obviously mayo 317 me 212 i suppose it was a bit of a a nothing game i suppose in many ways bit of a dead rubber but i suppose for for mayo like with a lot of the some of the new players coming in again the likes of jack carney and obviously paul towie as well they're uh like they, they are still bringing through a lot of uh underage players at the moment themselves as well yeah well james horan is just fantastic for bringing in new blood like he's always been that like yeah, young players, um, but also, like, because Mayo have some good young players coming through, but also, like, throughout the time he's brought in lads, you know, at different ages, um, he gives guys runs. He plays new players. He's not afraid to keep the squad fresh and the team fresh, which are two massive things, and he always used the league for that. He's used here in Division 2 now, so they can still win games comfortably, but even when they were Division 1 last year and they got relegated, he was giving guys games, and he will do that, and he'll find players. So, the key for them is about finding players. I, I, I was really disappointed with me in that game because like not playing against a full Mayo team, you would expect more from them. I don't think they're near Mayo standard, but you would expect better from them in that kind of game. Um, 
So, but yeah, Mayo breezing through Division Two, um, they'll build up a lot of momentum. The only question you'd ask is like, there will be a big step up when they play against a Division One type team, and if that's in a big championship knockout game, you know, it could just they could just be hit hard and how how do they recover from it but um yeah the goal threat looks really good for them and just their style of play like they tackled from the front Aiden O'Shea came back on and looked very good for a guy who's come back from a nasty injury like so he looked very comfortable fielding ball kicked a point big turnover and that's the nucleus of their team is how they played last year they'll tackle from the front they'll tackle hard they'll turn you over and they'll go for the, the juggler so if they can add in one or two new players to what they had last year you know, they're away with it but like that team that was there last year they're still fresh and young and ready to go with the experience they had from last year so they're in a really good place and I think Rob Henley's looked solid in the game so far um because that's a big one for them now in goal and they kind of just have to to get behind him in goal because the only thing that's going to kind of he's not going to be short on talent but like his his confidence might have taken a bit of a rattle over the last few years and they need to st- stay by him because to play against Dublin the hill will put enough doubts in his in his in his mind by roaring and jeering at him. So he needs to have the confidence of like as long as he's playing well that he's playing there and he has that constant, you know, up until those big games and he can build those foundations because yeah, the the big teams are all strong in goal. And that's a point that Kerry now they weren't were without their number one, but the goalkeeper was was kind of limiting them in that second half when they had to kick into the wind. I know he wasn't getting as many options for kickouts and stuff like that, but it just they just their kick, their restart was very slack. Yeah, and I suppose obviously, like from a from a Mead point of view, like obviously in that Mayo game, I suppose they made ten changes. Obviously coming in there, the likes of James Connell and coming back in, Mickey Newman as well. I suppose yeah. like with with Mead, it's a, they're a hard one to call them, anyways, because like they they definitely do have like one or two top players coming through, but it seems for for Andy McEntee, he just can't quite seem to to put all the pieces together at the moment, anyways. Yeah, yeah, it's just like the McIntyre's a royalty down there. Like, so be careful what you say about them. But like, <laughs> I just think that like they they aren't making massive progress for me. Um, but when I was asked my predictions on who I thought was going to get promoted, I, I I thought Mead would get promoted because I thought they'd take the league very seriously, and I think they have expectations to get back to Division One. And looking at the other teams around them, I I thought that they're capable of that, but. I just think they're a good, they're a good bit off. Like there's a there's a gap there between like your top eight and even your ten, then and ten, and then after that. And I think that like even they're a nice bit off of even your Ross Commons. Like and yeah, I just think there's a good your Ross Common and Armar even a good bit ahead of them. And yeah, just Leinster football in general. Like another game, like watching Leash against Kildare. Like just the, the pace of the play is just so slow. Um, yeah, it's just not very competitive, and yeah, the, the the province is just struggling at the moment. And Mead, like Mead club football, is very poor at the moment. And yeah, I just don't, I don't see the massive progress that's there at the moment. I don't see it. Last year, people were getting excited when they're built. Like I didn't, like I, I don't, I don't massively rate that team to be honest. I think they've got some really good individuals. Kyog and Killian O'Sullivan's a really good player. Menton midfield, how what he does is very good, but. I just don't think they're a really good team and I don't think they work very well together. I think he's trying to create like a really fast, dynamic team, but I don't think it all glues in very well. Um, I don't have great time for them at the moment, but he is trying a few new guys and um, if they get back to Division 1, they uncover one or two guys, they improve and they're competitive and more competitive or not more competitive, they're competitive at all, which they haven't been in the past against Dublin. That that probably is improvement, like, but... Um, yeah, me, me should be expecting more. Mm. And I suppose another team, obviously, from, from Leinster, I suppose, in, in that group that was struggling, I suppose, in terms of results, maybe not so much in terms of performance, but that's Westmead. I mean, they probably mm. should have beaten me the first day. Like, they had the game within their grasp against Mayo as well. They had opportunities. And I suppose if they had it beaten down, they would have left themselves in a fantastic position to avoid relegation with the fact that they'd be playing leash as opposed to Cork. But I suppose in the end down just just pipped them despite Westmead's kind of late fight back there in the in the second half. Yeah, I I um I tuned in when they were only had scored three points and down were all over them and they scored a goal and then the penalty, John Heston missed the penalty, which is uncharacteristic of him because he's he's obviously such a good such a good and clinical forward. Um so 
yeah, and then they end up only losing by a point. Like so that that would have but when they were when like the goal was kind of out of nothing when you know they had only scored three points and then the penalty came after that and they kind of got momentum surge. They were struggling before that. So the way they've set up this year, they're kind of they're not playing much football, I suppose. They're they've got men behind the ball and they're kind of they're being very um yeah, they're just being very pragmatic in the way they're playing and they're trying to get the most out of the, the squad they have. They've Heston inside and he's kind of very dangerous, obviously, and he looks very fit and very sharp. And Kieran Martin and Jerry Egan and these guys, it's good to see like they've got some big players come back to fitness. Canel in the middle of the field looks good. New midfielder there is very physical and very good in the air. He's got a great goal. Um so like yeah, they've got their big names kind of all around there, which is always good for SME because some years they just don't have their main players playing, you know, and it makes a massive difference for a smaller county. But um, yeah, it's the way they're playing. There's certain limitations you're gonna you're gonna get with that, you know. So in those games, as you're saying, they did well, but they didn't win it. Like when you play, when you're set up to play in a certain way, that's what's generally gonna happen. Like you can't turn your dominance into scores because you're playing so conservatively. And they got caught out in those first two games. And then down said, I didn't see the part where down were very strong. I just seen where Westmead came back and it was just momentum surge and they didn't quite get over the line. But um, yeah, I think Westmead have some brilliant footballers and I'm right on the border of Westmead. So I'd like to see them too well, but uh, I still, I still think that when Westmead are at their best with John Heston in the middle of the field. And I'd like to see him out around there and just really dominate and dictating and being on the front foot. And you might say like being put is more pro, is more positive by putting one of your best players full forward. I don't think so. They're looking for him to kind of do massive work in there on his own. I'd love to see him midfield, and like anyone who can get the better of him in the middle of the field and dominate the game above him, you know, take their hat off to him. And that includes Fenton. Like so, um, that's that's a step that I'd like to see them making. And in previous years, he's been struggling with knocks and injuries and his hip and stuff like that. But he looks like he's moving quite well. So I'd like to see him playing in a more out the field role, and I think he can push them on a bit. But you know, if they can stay up, it's still been a good year. But if not, the league, the league is what they'll be judged on because they're not gonna, they're not gonna win Leinster like so. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, no, it's I've hard. Thought... It's hard for those counties, you know, and it's hard for the players, and um, you know, and they lose belief. And I said that's just a great thing that all because of COVID, all their players are there and available this year. So mm. that's that's a, that gives them a better chance anyway. Because in other years, all it takes one or two guys is to say, "Oh, you know what's the point here?" and they'll move. And another one or two guys will come back. And the team is constantly changing. Where they have the majority of their best players in the county available and relatively fit at the moment. And that's just good for for the county itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've a family from Westmead, so I definitely wouldn't want to see them win Leinster. Anyways, I, I still get two thousand four mentioned to me every time I go down, even though like Dublin have, have pretty much hockeyed Westmead every time since. But I suppose next up for, for Westmead is Cork. Obviously, they, they beat Clare. Bit of a weird situation. They'll be, they'll be going into that game with a bit of momentum. Two wins from two, but it's still a relegation playoff. What have you made of Cork so far, and in particular in that game against Clare? I suppose a one-point yeah. victory in the end. Yeah, so they they, sh- they showed like massive composure. It's kind of winning at the end. Um Ian Maguire is really impressive in the middle of the field for me from them. And he's been really impressive the last few years. He's just really blossomed into like fantastic midfielder, like your modern day midfielder. He has everything and a massive like determination. He's constantly going forward. He plays with massive intent and he's good at everything. Maybe not outstanding at at anything individually, but he's really good at everything. And he plays with intent and hunger and he's just a fantastic midfielder. And he, he gave them a massive, like he led the charge of thought in the middle of the field for them in terms of their attitude. And they kept at it. And yeah, like it, it's momentum in terms of winning, but obviously probably deflate and um, they'd be hoping to have got out rather than be fighting to stay in. But I think they'd be safe. Um, and like if they can come into Munster Championship off the back of three wins in a row, three good wins in a row like that, you know, it's a good play. Cork over the last few years has all been momentum. So, you know, they kind of have a good league run they carry it in. So, um, yeah, they're just trying to get, get a balance right. Um, they lost their other midfielder, um, Hanlon is it from to Cruise here. So he's a big loss. Um they were playing Walsh midfield and he seems to be a, a good um a good partner for Maguire in there. And inside Kieran Sheehan is one who kind of be looking for big things now as as the year progresses in there for him inside with um with Connolly. So yeah, it's just trying to get their their best team out in the field. Loads of good footballers of court, trying to get their best their best team out in the field and trying to obviously stay up but get the most out of that final game because when they come into Munster, yeah, they're gonna to have to hit it hard because you're seeing there Claire Tip haven't had a great league, but Tip are strong and 
Kerry, obviously. So um, it's going to be very competitive. They're going to need to hit the ground running. Yeah, and I suppose for Kildare, obviously, they racked up a 218 to, to 1A victory over Leash. I suppose positive from Kildare in many ways, I suppose, with some of those under 20 lads in the side, the likes of Aaron Masterson and obviously, of course, Jimmy Hoyland as well. Derek Hirwan, obviously, coming in from a different age group, but he's very talented as well. I suppose Kildare, like they're definitely showing signs of improvement under Jack O'Connor. But I suppose when you look at the Clare defeat, obviously the week previous, it's kind of epitomizes Kildare in many ways because anytime they seem to get a big victory, they seem to back it up with a, you know, losing to a, a so called lesser county. But what's your uh, take on Kildare and, and that win in general? Just to look at Kildare, they're a very impressive team. Like they're big men, like, and they're all lean and they all move really well. And they're kind of these big guys who, when they want to open up, they eat ground. And yeah, they look really good. But they, like Jack Connor talking about um, them doing a lot of work on their kick passing, but everything just looked really casual, slow. Um, like I said, but watching the Leinster teams, I, I kind of get that vibe off them at the moment. The pace isn't quite what the other count, uh, provinces are, but it just looked very, yeah, just very casual. And you know, like even when Dublin kind of keep everything nice and controlled and they keep possession or carry or Donny Gall or these teams, it's not casual. It's a big difference, and Kildare just looked very casual to me, which was a, which was a bit of a worry. But they Masterson didn't start, but they brought him on, and he, he looked good. And he's obviously was a really good player in the twenties. Um, Flynn midfield looks a really good player. He's very dynamic, he's very physical, and he's a really good footballer. Um, and they're playing Feely, then kind of floating around the place and trying to get the most out of Kevin Feely, who's a fantastic, fantastic player. And they're trying to get the most out of him. So it's a bit of a gamble because he obviously gives you a great platform in the middle of the field, but they're trying to look for more from him now. So they need the midfielders to step up and they need him to kind of fill into that role. So um, inside Kerwin gives them a great platform. They, they do have the talent, you know, so it's just a case now of getting the attitude right and putting the performance in because they need to get mass. If there's any team in Lens who have the players to put a challenge to Dublin, it's Kildare, you know, so and if they have the physicality, they have the fitness, and have the players, but like I wouldn't put one cent on them doing it. <laughs> so like there's massive kind of attitude, and kind of just style of play issues, um, and they need just to sharpen up. And I know that it's their kind of style in Kildare. They always have big men and they always have rangy guys, but just bordered on casual against Leash, really bordered on casual. Even when the game was kind of a bit more in the money, it just very very rehearsed kind of kick passing back, not going anywhere. Um, and done very casually so I, I wasn't massively impressed with them and Leash are just struggling at the moment so um, they fought for a while but you know they just struggled they, they even looked like they were struggling at the, at the pace like and physically like to stay with it so um, yeah there was kind of a I, I actually stopped watching I was watching that game. I had to stop watching it which is really hard to watch um, because yeah, as I said it was just a casual low paced game and it's just that confusion between watching what the top teams are doing and trying to execute it in the wrong way. That's just what I thought. So, um, but like I said, Kildare have the quality, they have the players. You know, you just don't you you wouldn't know what they could do. So, it won't be a lack. It won't be true lack of quality. Yeah, and I suppose with Leash, like because I felt in Division Two last year, they they showed a lot of fight. Like I think a lot of people had Leash to to go down last year, and they showed a lot of fight even in that Fermanagh game last year. I remember to to fight back, but it seems at the moment they just seem devoid of confidence. They don't really. I know when you don't have Donny Kingston in there, they don't have that out ball. But I suppose for the moment, it's not looking too uh, too positive at the moment for for Leash supporters. Yeah, no Kingston, no Begley in that game. Um... John Lachlan's a fantastic player in the middle of the field and every time he got on it, he was trying to inspire them with runs and they didn't look like they were disinterested or anything like that and they did look like they were trying hard. I genuinely thought like at times confidence could be a massive thing because they just did look a little bit yeah, off of it and they just did, they weren't, they were kind of almost protecting themselves and it wasn't necessarily because of everyone behind the ball. I just felt they just looked a bit tired and um, Evan O'Carroll was really trying to carry them like trying to go off in big runs and just said John Lachlan was trying to make bursts and they did get some good scores and Gary Walsh in there is kind of a good 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 out finisher and um but just they just lack kind of the, the quality overall. Um so and the conditioning, you know, it's hard for teams like that. You, like if lads haven't been doing the conditioning on their own, they haven't had enough time to get the conditioning up to scratch and they didn't look like they're not I don't think they're the mass, most conditioned team I know it. So um I think that was a step. Uh, that was a big thing for me. 
um, watching the two teams, and especially against Kildare, because as I said, such an impressive team to look at. Just all big, lean, still strong guys, kind of floating around the field, ease in their ease, and then taking off with these big runs. So, um, just, just look very different than Leash to see the two of them. But um, yeah, like Leash would have been expected to go down last year, so um, they just have to take stay competitive and take what they can out of Division Two, and then try and get back up there because I think that's as high up as they're really gonna go with this bunch anyway. Yeah, and I suppose for Division Three North, obviously a big win for for Derry over Cavan, one sixteen to to two eleven. I suppose discussing Cavan, I suppose first of all, it's a it's a very interesting situation with what's happened with Cavan, obviously winning the Ulster Championship last year. And, you know, coming into Division 3, like I, I felt personally they'd win every game and, and get promoted, go up as champions, carry on that momentum from last year. But mm. defeat to, to Derry and all of a sudden now they're playing Wicklow, you know, in a game to avoid relegation to Division 4. It's, it's hard to know how they've ended up in, uh, in this position. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't see the games before this. I seen last weekend, I seen the Derry Cavan game. Um, I didn't see the other games with Cavan. Um, so I don't know, I didn't even pay much heed to the team sheets I assume that they were missing guys but like they had Killian Clark last week starting Falk- Faulkner was starting and Galligan came on um, like he made a massive input for them he obviously won an all-star but like he turned against them last year when he was coming on all of the games he turned on the- on its head when he came on and then when he started obviously he played played a big role so um, not quite a full strength but they did all right in that game against Derry. Derry were really impressive, like really, really good. Like they just looked like such a good team. And um, yeah, like I, I, I wouldn't have been getting too, I wouldn't be looking at that performance and saying Cavan are really bad. And I'd be more looking at it and saying Derry looked like real mm-hmm. prospects for an Ulster title. Um, I thought that Rogers at fullback, I've always said that Rogers at fullback is a brilliant player, a really good, fantastic player to come out with the ball. Christy McCaig is one of the best defenders in the country, if not the best defender. If you put him in a cornerback context, he's playing centre-half back again. Fantastic player to come out with the ball. And then they've got real pace. And then the midfield, um, you know, they've got Connor Glass, who's a fantastic, fantastic player. He gets around the field. He's really good at tackler. He covers the ground really well, and he's really good in possession. The half forward line is massive pace. Uh, centre-forward, really good, really good uh, contest, or option for kickouts and the full forward McGuigan, he was fantastic like he's such a good player off both feet and they just looked like a really good team the whole way through um that had a style of play and you're kind of thinking to yourself geez where did Derry start playing like this but they've got all of their club guys back and just looked really really strong really good flowing fast team who moved the ball with the foot and have good players throughout their squad and um, or throughout their 15. So, yeah, for me, what I got from that game was Derry or team that should be, yeah, if you have a few at the beginning before that game, I think they were 20 to 1 for Ulster title. I think it's gone, the odds aren't as good as that now, but yeah, they just looked really good to me. I was really impressed by them. Yeah, I suppose it's interesting watching them play as well because normally we're. Rory Gallagher teams, you know, it's everyone kind of behind the ball, blanket yeah. defence, all that. And we don't know what Derry yet. Maybe it's because maybe they're not playing a, as high level opposition. You know, maybe if they play Donegal in, in that championship game, that's very well how they could set up. But I suppose, yeah, like what, what you said with Derry, I'd agree with you as well. Like with the likes of Shane McGuigan, Niall Lachlan, even Emma Bradley in midfield, I thought as well, was really impressive, right. kicked three points. And they definitely have a, a lot of very, very talented footballers at the moment. Yeah, uh, Lachlan centre four is really good. Bradley is left footed as well, which he gives the team a balance in the middle of the field. He's more of a football option than glass and scored three points. And yeah, just gives them a really nice balance to their team down there. He plays a lot of football down that left wing and he loves to kick the ball and he loves to go forward with the ball. Where glass is more of a conservative player, like, you know, he gets on the ball a lot, but he does the same thing unless he does kind of have the little burst or a bit of madness every so often, but generally he gets the ball, he recycles it, you know, he keeps it calm. And like, as I said, McCaig, Rogers, they're really good players. They like to take the man on, but they're still really calm. So Bradley gives them a nice balance and they're two wing forwards. Um, it's the first time I've seen either of them play, but they just love to jink and turn and twist and take the man on and dummy. And it's great to see, like, and it fits into their style, right? You put a lad like that on the Dublin team, you look like, geez, what's that lad doing? Because the rest of them are they just they have a really um they look like a team of 
uh, pe- people have been saying like Derry club football is fantastic, really high standard, and it always has been. And like for years, Derry haven't been picking their best players haven't been making themselves available, and it just looked like a load of like really good club players kind of finally getting their crack because they were just guys who weren't following the rules of inter county football necessarily. Like they were happy to dummy twist, dummy turn, get in, and sometimes you can do too much of that, and you learn the lessons of a blanket defence very quickly. But it's just refreshing really refreshing to see and like this is for a team that essentially like that team they're in the very early stages of of that project and just a really good and as for Gallagher like when he was over Donny Gall he was quite uh, restrictive in how they played but he took them over a kind of a real transition period like it was a massive transition period when Jim had gone and before that team of the young lads who are all coming through now were getting there so it was a hard time for him and he obviously was over for Manor but like when he was in with Jim and Donny Gall like Donny Gall still had a lot of very good counter-attacking movements, some very good attacking movements, and how they come out with defence and stuff like that. So, you know, he's always a good manager, and you kind of have to, you know, managers have to work with what they have. So, I was completely shocked to see a team play like that with him as manager as well. But maybe we're being a bit harsh on him because he had to play a certain way with the teams that he's had. Um, I was just really excited by them. They were the highlight for me of the weekend watching that Derry team. I was so, so uh, excited, and especially McGuigan inside. Like, he's just such a good player, and he's so two footed, and it just shows the 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 strength of having two really good feet because they couldn't mark him. You know, he just come in and step in, shoot. Like at one stage, you're trying to wonder what foot was he. Like it wasn't really that clear because he, he doesn't even lean off of one side. Um, and he looked like a really good player. So t- can he carry that? He was so good. And at everything he did, it'd be hard to see why he couldn't carry that through the championship. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how how he does. Yeah, absolutely. Hitting him. <laughs> what did you say there? Sorry. If he gets a Neil McGee or somebody hitting him, it might be a different story. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might keep him a bit quiet then. But I suppose we'll have to see if uh, if Neil McGee's even back by then. I suppose, but. But um, but as for Fermanagh, I mean they drew with, with Longford. Um, I, I didn't see the game now against Longford, but I did see them against uh, Cavan a couple of weeks ago. And I suppose yeah. I know Sean Quigley hit a late point in that game, so I think a lot of people would have had Fermanagh potentially getting relegated or finishing bottom. So I think you know they deserve massive credit getting into a promotion playoff. I didn't think they'd get relegated, but I definitely didn't think they'd get promotion playoff. I thought they just survived. Like I think they're good enough to survive in Division Three. Um, so they've done really well, of course. Um. For Longford more is what I'm looking at in that like, and the fixture looks like they're going to go down now which isn't good for Longford football because they have been going well for the last couple of years and they were really unlucky in the league last year and now you know if they had won that game um, so they've just been really unlucky and like for a county like that they, what, they could be Division 4 now next year like and hmm. I don't think it's reflective of where like club football is in a good place in Longford and they have been quite competitive over the last few years you know and they do have a really good batch of players there at the moment um so it's just harsh it's very hard on them so they just have to now stay together and have a good finish to the year obviously fight like hell to try and stay up and then have a good next year like but um that's more what i was looking at that i didn't see that uh, that game but when i was looking at that that's more what i was thinking of just it's just not great for for longford and it's kind of the victims of that league structure this year because I don't think they'd go down if there was a normal league structure. Yeah, and I, I suppose for, for for obviously Tipperary, like they'll be the ones that'll be taking on Longford. I suppose uh, an interesting one with Tipperary, I suppose in similar fashion to to Cavan. I suppose they showed some sort of promise, obviously when they got that win over Wicklow. But I suppose in the end, it's uh, another uh, it's a relegation playoff for them as well. Yeah, like that's a shock to see that because they, but like. Tip last year looked so impressive. Um, so like they don't have a rear in this year now, which is a, a loss to them. But um, Colin Colin Reardon who came back from the AFL. But um, yeah, Terry, I didn't see that. The like, guy seen Cavan and Tip going up there, to be honest. And mm-hmm. it's just not a uh, not a good um, not a good fix. Not a really good position for them to be in. They don't have momentum now, and they could get caught. But like they had to scramble last year, and. Yeah, it just doesn't look doesn't look good for them at the same time because as I said Longford are a good team, so it's not gonna be easy. But you would imagine that they have enough quality there, their inside line. Connor Sweeney has been really good. He's carried in his all star form, he's been really good. Philly Ryan kicked a few points there the last day. And yeah, if they can stay up, they can get a few fines and they can they can lash at Munster again. 
you know, but they would have been hoping to build on a Munster Championship by getting up to Division 2. And that would have mm. been good progress for them in the year, like to get back to Division 2, kind of defend their Munster title as well as they can and get up. Um, like, to go down to Division 4, like, it's just mad how, like, again, yeah. the structure and stuff like that, but... They, it's on it's, they, they have been very they have been very poor and very lax overall so um they'll have to step it up a massive amount and i'm just excited to see tip play with philly ryan inside i just want to see how he kind of fits into it um and see how he gets on um you know it's a great kind of opportunity for him um on a dublin squad and yeah just for, for players like him i just think it's great um mm. to take on that challenge and go out and try and search search for inter county football so that's that's what I'm really looking forward to when I see them. I haven't seen them play this year now yet, but just from following the highlights and seeing the match reports and stuff like that. But seeing Philly in action, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing with them anyway. Yeah, I suppose who knows? Maybe Philly can end up setting a bit of a, a trend, I suppose, maybe with, with players who can't break yeah. on to the Dublin team and, and maybe have family elsewhere. But I suppose yeah. Limerick, they, uh, they got a big win, obviously, over Wicklow. I suppose Limerick are looking pretty good at the moment as well. Um, <laughs> You know, like obviously yep. coming up from Division 4 last year, potentially should have beaten Tipperary, of course, yep. in the Munster Championship. And now two wins from from three, I suppose, in Division 4 uh, or Division 3 South. Yeah, 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 exactly. All those things you said last year, so unlucky. Being extra time, like the Connor Sweeney sideline, like they had Tip beaten last year. So to come in and they beat them in the first game, then again this year kind of made a point with that. And they've been... Yeah, they have a great chance of going up. Like it, I didn't see it. I, I've seen games of Limerick. I've seen that Limerick Tipperary game last year, and Limerick were very good in the way they played. The kind of were just, it looked like a really hard team to play against. A really hard team to play against, and like for that, it's kind of like, how do you, uh, like, they just seem to play a bit different and through the hands a lot, and they have a lot of guys who love to take on the man. And like Corbett, a centre back, is just fantastic. Like, what a player, centre half back. And he loves to take the man on. And yeah, they just seem like quite a difficult team to play against. They're quite dogged. They work really hard. They keep it through the hands and they constantly try to take the man on. And with teams playing all so similar at the moment in GA, a team who plays a bit different like that, you know, it makes, makes a difference. And, um, but yeah, like, I really didn't, I didn't see, I didn't see that coming this year for them to go up. I would have thought mm. they'd won the team fighting to, to stay, I would have thought it'd be a great achievement for them to stay. Like so, for have a chance to go up now is 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 massive for them. So, um, and it's great to see like Limerick and Offaly. When I was growing up, like watching like Limerick and Offaly were quite good teams. You Limerick with John Galvin mm-hmm. around the middle, and they were, they were a good strong team. And and Offaly, like obviously a traditionally really strong football county. So to see those teams get better and improve, yeah, it's great. It's great for football and. Um, yeah, Limerick obviously has the hurling and, and the the rugby, but it's a massive city, and it's still like for Munster football, it's good to see Gaelic football to, to be to be relatively strong and competitive in, in Limerick. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose because we're awfully like they're flying really at the moment across all GA, like really when you look at the hurlers as well, and then the footballers finishing top, of course, of, of that group, and Shane Lowry obviously coming in back on them, I suppose. You know, it's um, I suppose it's it's good times to be an Offaly fan. Maybe I mean I'm not too sure what the level will be that they can get to, but I suppose for the moment, anyway, they're doing they're doing as good as they can, really. Well, they hit the floor, so it could only it could only have got better. Like like what a strong traditional county, and they hit the absolute floor. They were being so badly ran, and they were just so poor and not competitive at every level. Um. So, but like club football in Offaly is quite strong, relatively strong Leinster, Leinster stages or Leinster levels. And they just seem to have like, they, you know, bringing McNamee back was a big, obviously a big one because he's been very good. And um, yeah, they have good forwards in there and they have good, they have some good young players coming through and Offaly is strong and physical and they're proud, like they're a proud county. And uh, so it's just great to see, great to see them doing really well. I, I don't know if they can, if they'll be able to push on and get that win, I, I I don't know if they if they have it enough quality to do that. And more than the herders, like it's great to have this kind of initial little. But then they if they want progress, both teams need to see this out now, like and you know and have a, a really good finish to to that campaign and then a good finish to a good competitive championship. Like you know they need to be like winning a couple of league games and then losing the the decider 
isn't going to be progress for Offaly football, like you know, because they're so poor now at the moment. They need to start having tangible change. So um, it's a huge game for them. Like that's a that's bigger than a championship for them. You know, if they can get out, up out of that division, and like it'd be absolutely huge for Offaly football, and especially when you are seeing the hurling is improving. But the hurling, like the two, the two are. It's a dual county, like so. For football in there to to get that would be massive, massive for the young players. You know, next year when you've COVID ended, like to keep lads there and keep lads ground to keep the interest in football be huge. So that's a massive, massive game for them, and they'll go hell for leather. Um, so we'll see. And they're still relying on McNamee and stuff inside, but they do have a love. They have some lovely footballers. They have some lovely footballers. They've Panda inside there in the forward line, and they've Anton O'Sullivan, like some really, really good footballers. Um, guys who are really good schools, colleges, footballers. And um, but yeah, just awfully just haven't been <laughs> haven't been knocking on the door in a long time. So it's improvement from nothing, and uh, but it's not improvement yet. You know, still need to win that next one. Yeah, still a bit to go for them, I suppose. And I suppose yeah. we'll we'll touch on Division Four, I suppose briefly. Obviously, wins for for both Antrim and and, and Loud, of course. And obviously, Dave both progressed. I mean, in the end, I suppose for for Mickey Hart's men, obviously they they lost the first game obviously against Antrim but I suppose they've ended up uh, responding with, with back-to-back wins obviously with that uh, very comfortable win in the end over over Sligo yeah 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 Antrim are one who who I, I wasn't really they obviously did they were very unlucky last year they did quite well last year um, and they've got potential there they've got good again good, good club good enough strong clubs down there but um, they weren't a team who I was kind of predicting to come out I, I i did i did think loud in division four was really i was expecting them to to come up um but antrim have been really strong so um hmm. they have good players um i haven't i the, the only division four games that i've seen have been um loud's games because i haven't keep an eye on them i think there's there's some lovely players um but just watching antrim's progress and more than i suppose limericks it's not out of the blue because they have been quite consistent over the last few years they're consistently getting better um but yeah, that's huge for them now, and they just need, if they can get back up, it would be massive. Well, it'd be brilliant for for football in in Belfast, like absolutely brilliant. Like, mm-hmm. so I'd like to see them coming up. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a strange enough one in that division four, like because there's no relegation in as well, and it's just kind of a weird enough division. You just need to get out of there. You need to get out of there and then build from there. But the, the team that I said I have seen in division four is loud, and I think that they just have some lovely players. Kieran Byrne is fantastic um, player back from the AFL. He got really bad injury since he came back. And I just think he's a fantastic player who has a lot to offer. Um, and they're playing him in different positions. Number nine, and he's back the last day, but he's kind of playing in different roles. They've got Mulroy inside and um, even Duffy. Like They just have some really, really good players. Um, but it's about getting it together and building up a bit of belief. So, and then Mickey over them. And like Mickey doesn't have much time, but being in Division 4 could suit him because you know they can build a bit of belief in there. So, Again, massively crucial of all divisions to get out. You need to get out of there. You need to get out of Division Four. So, um, and they edged Sligo the last day, who have been disappointing again, but they're in a bad enough place. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose for Carlo, they obviously beat Wexford, um, of course, with a with a late victory. I, I actually watched this game. I felt Carlo were actually quite impressive, especially in the in the closing stages. But I suppose a word on Wexford. I mean, it's 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 mad to think that I suppose ten years ago they were in the Leinster a Leinster final against the Dubs and they've really fallen. I suppose that's, I suppose maybe an example, especially at least a football anyway, of a, of a county that I suppose has been ran pretty badly, I suppose, over the past number of years. Yeah. You've seen there, they kind of tried to make them, they made the investment obviously in the hurling and they tried to make, to match that with football because they tried to make it from the top down with Galvin coming in and then he didn't stay. And then he was, he was saying that he wasn't quite happy with kind of the, the clash there with the hurling. So they've got like, Things aren't all football isn't really doesn't seem to be a priority in Wexford at the moment, basically. And um you can see that, you know. Jonathan Beelan left this year. He's a really good player. Paul Beelan's son. Um he's a really good free taker, a really good finisher inside. He's not there. And like little things like that, like they don't have the players to to make up for, you know, when they're missing a couple. But um they need to get out of there. Um and yeah, I, I'd heard that they were like that they were going very well this year in terms of that they'd, they'd done a lot of work on their own, a uh, conditioning work and it all been conditioning work. And they'd done a lot of football work under Galvin. So they felt like the two would, would come together this year, but like, you know, when you're not coming out, that's a local derby though, Wexford and Carlo. So like it can go either mm. way at the best of times. Um, 
but Carlo football at the moment is in a better place than Wexford. So um, it's not often you've said that in the past. Like so, um, Carlo, yeah, Carlo are in a good place. Bounce straight back out of Division Four uh, is what they're going to be hoping to do, and you wouldn't be shocked. I I think from from my recollection of the fixtures, Carlo aren't Car- Carlo are playing Antrim, are they not? I think they're playing out. I think. Because I think Carlo, Carlo, Carlo finished top, yeah, so they'd finished the, okay. the second place team. I've no idea what the venue now were. I think it, that, that hasn't been decided at the time of this recording, but but yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, yeah, it's a tricky one, but um, you allow that would, for me the team who are the only team in Division Four who I've actually seen playing. Um, it's hard to see all of the games, but um, yeah, they're the team who I, I, I just on paper I like to look at their team, just in, obviously with a very good manager over them and a lot of money pumped in. Um, and a lot of interest in football down there. So just be see their progress and they're coming at a kind of decent enough base. So um but the other it's just a dog fight and you need to get out of division four. You need to get out of division four. Like you can pro- remember what's common being you just need to get out of there. Hmm. So um and then you can build on that. But it's just a horrible division to, to be in. <laughs> so if you can get anything out of your COVID year, just get the hell out of uh, out of there and then reassess next year. Absolutely, yeah. Like, and I, I suppose that's a, a nice way to transition into the hurling. Obviously, with with the Wexford hurlers, obviously, I suppose not a not a particularly great day for them either. Obviously, they were beaten quite comfortably by Kilkenny. Obviously, a lot going on behind the scenes with Wexford with the whole COVID situation over the past week or so. But I suppose for Kilkenny, I mean, TJ Reid scoring one eighteen. I mean, probably yeah. one of the best hurlers in the country on his day. Absolutely, no doubt about it. I don't think anyone can can disagree with that. Yeah, TJ back um, just showed. Yeah, like he, he just flew back in. You know, he's he's ready to uh, ready to hit the ground, and uh, he was just really impressive. Um, Wexford just looked a little bit like they're a bit off in it, you know. And th- like that game, that's a game that that kind of this bunch have really defined themselves over. That they've really gone at Kilkenny over the last couple of years and had some big results, and they've really flown into it. And you have to match Kilkenny in that. You know, in that in that you know fight and work rate, um, and over the last few years, some teams have been bigger and, sh- and stronger than them, and more physical than them. And that's why teams are beating them. But like Wexford just didn't look like they had that fight in them. So, um, one of the big things they were discussing on the Sunday game, and I think it is accurate. Like, Davy is very much based on like plans and schedules and um, game plans, but also like schedule plans. And they did look like a team who were training quite hard. Like, so. Mm. Uh, like he is, he is with a team now who've done quite well. But they haven't had that big breakthrough, like that. They haven't got over that line, that big line at the end. So he maybe is conditioning to be a bit peaking a bit later in the year. It's a risk that you that you take, like, because then you lose momentum and all of these things. So, um, but they did look like a team that've been training quite hard, and you know, you that sharpens the hurling, and you play against a team who are, you know, fresh and hungry, and you've got tired legs, be badly punished and. Kenny just kill Kenny them like they just you know, they just blitz them like and um it's not good for confidence because even though Wexford have been in a good place the last couple of years and they have been their standard has been very high, you're still feeding that inferiority complex against Kid Kenny, which I don't think is anything you should ever do. Um you need to stay on top of them teams and and you know stay, you know, keep keep certain standards against them. And they definitely didn't keep their standards. It was more like a performance for Kenny and Wexford that you would have seen from maybe six, seven years ago. Um, yeah, Westford just looked off, off the pace, way off the pace. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I'd said it this time of year, you just don't know. I, I noticed that in the first week of the hurling games, you could really notice that difference in teams who had trained hard and the difference in teams who kind of were coming into it a little bit fresher. Mm-hmm. So and that's just the the nature of that. That's sometimes the case in all the in the leagues always, but like especially now the nature of the beast with the COVID structures. So. Um, that was quite apparent to me and that's the point they made in the Sunday game was that like if Wexford come in and if if the tables are turned in the championship and Kilkenny are looking a bit of a gas team and Wexford are flying at them or whoever then everyone be saying isn't Davey a genius he timed them right you know so um, I think it's a bit of a risk how how close the league is in I think you should kind of you should be trying to build momentum but you know mm. he's he's doing what he's doing and and he's been successful obviously so he knows he's back in what he's doing and and uh, but that's why I think led into that game because whatever about Wexford losing games they generally always have a fight about them they didn't 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I suppose from a Kilkenny point of view, like where would you even put them, I suppose, going into the into the All-Ireland Championship in terms of obviously with, with Brian Cody at the helm? I suppose there's a general consensus that maybe this year might be his last year, but I know people have been saying that for the past five or six years and it, it never does seem to be his last year. Where would you put Kilkenny in terms of maybe competing for that All-Ireland or even catching the likes of Limerick? Because I suppose they were the last team to beat Limerick in the championship yeah. anyways two years ago, obviously in that 2019 semi-final. And they beat Limerick by playing Kilkenny Hurling. Like that's how they beat Limerick. Like they literally held their like they literally held their position. They beat Kenny in the air. They they beat them playing how they play. And I think that's what you see even like with Dublin and football or Kerry before that, or you see in like teams are now trying to play like Limerick and you're not going to beat Limerick in that game. Like, you know, they're playing through the hands. They're very physical. They're big men. They're really comfortable at that. They're, that's their game. And like even people were talking about Galway beating Limerick because they're able to match them physically and all this. But like Galway's chance to beat Limerick is why they obviously have big men, but they need to play their game, you know. And um, yeah, like for me, the Munster Championship looks a lot stronger. But Kilkenny... Yeah, I just think because they're all playing that type of way, but Kilkenny, when they get what they do, do right and they get it on the money, I and mean, Brian Cody is very simple in what he asks for, but when they get it right, like you're not beating it, like, you know, it's, that'll suffocate the life out of anyone. And when they get on the money, but like it's obviously hard to do that unless you have the personnel like kind of stand toe to toe. So, um, in terms of your question, I, I, I wouldn't be thinking they're going to win all Ireland, no, but um, against Limerick, I think that they're a team, if they caught Limerick in a knockout game, you know, they could be a team that could take them down because they've already shown by doing what they do, it can break that Limerick system. But it takes massive physicality, massive work rate, like huge because Limerick are bigger men and they are obviously so set in their, their game plan. But for me, looking at the, the games, the teams are all look very strong or Munster, like Tipperary obviously looks so fluid and so balanced in attack. Um, Waterford are a really good team. Like you'd see that they've carried on from last year. There's that, especially the last day, just that, work rate that speed that intensity um and when they get that going they're just so hard to beat and then cork look like a really good team again they've kind of gone back to their dna um donald grady they're kind of playing through the hands and their forward line just look a real goal threat real goal threat so um the teams that look best for me are in in munster even though galway obviously can't be can't be discounted or discredited either like so um it looks very open in one sense, but at the same time, Limerick could have been dominant. So um, mm. I think it'd be a good hurling championship, though, because a lot of them teams could beat each other. Like, you know, Waterford, um, Cork, Tip, and Limerick, they're, they're all good. And then Clare, obviously, are a good team as well. And you're going to, into Monday, like, they're all strong, you know, so it's going to be very, it's going to be all very competitive. I can't see anyone wiping the floor of someone in a, in a provincial semi final or, final or, or onwards. Mm. And would you still have Limerick maybe at the at the top? Because I think a lot of people, even though they haven't won a game so far this year, would probably still have them as the as the favourites going into the into the All Ireland Championship this year. Last year, the team that I that I picked was Galway, and even though they went closest to or somewhat close, I suppose Waterford did yeah, overall. Um, yeah, I just think that the way Galway play, I, I don't know if it's quite going to catch Limerick. Um, yeah, I think I think it's in one of those monster teams. I think is the team who's going to catch them. I I don't know quite where. Um, I think Limerick will get caught though. Um, but quite where I'm not sure. I don't know if Waterford are quite ready, but I I'd say Waterford. Um, mm. are the team that I just like them. I like the way they play. Um, they're so intense, but they just need to get the bodies back out and like get everyone out fit and be at full strength and stuff like that. But um, I'd say Waterford, but not with any confidence at you all. Know? Um. Yeah, and then it's it's obviously knockout this year. Like so, I just think one of the monster teams might build a bit of momentum. And so we'll see, we'll see. But Waterford are just a team who last year went well. Um, I fancied them as an outsider last year. I thought they would go well, but I didn't think they'd get to an Ireland final. Um, so I can't see any reason why they won't keep improving, and maybe they will this year. They'd have learned a lot from, um, they'd have learned a lot from last year, and then that win over Limerick was like a mental even though the, the sending off had a massive impact on the game, it would have been a massive mental lift as well. So, um, yeah, the way they play, they'll, you know, they'll get more and more confidence in that work rate, that speed, that intensity, that pushing up, um, bunch in the middle. So, yeah, they're the team that, that, I, that I fancy outside Limerick. 
Absolutely, yeah. It's definitely going to be interesting anyways to, to keep an eye on the on the hurling, obviously, over the next while and the football as well. Look, listen, Eamon, I appreciate your time anyways. I know we've gone on for a good over an hour here. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate your time anyways. No problem at all. It's great. It's great to have the games to talk about anyway. So, have them back. Thank <laughs> you.